Hello, everyone, and welcome to the author series on the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Ben Tanzer. Ben is a good friend and a fellow podcaster. He is an award-winning author and novelist, amongst many other talents. I hope we get to most of those. And today, it's a pleasure to have Ben join me to chat about his new novel, The Missing. The Missing is described as a deeply psychological portrait of a marriage that is both full of pathos and frighteningly real. Ben, so good to see you. How are you doing? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm good. It's so nice to be here and to see you. Right. Now you're no longer in Chicago, so I either have to find my way to Las Vegas or we have to find our way to these different platforms and keep dragging the other one onto our respective podcast. So dragging in the best way, clearly. Dragging in the best way. We're not going to be kicking and screaming. You know, I think we work well together. We should find ways to do more work together. I think that would be. I I would love to, that. Yeah. It's not just that you do this really well, which you do. I told you before, so now I'm just going to embarrass you. I really aspire to your level of uh, professionalism, but you know more than that, <laughs> I'm like a real energy person, meaning other people's energy, and you've got it. You always have it in abundance, so I admire that. It gets me excited to talk to you and learn what you're doing. Now. It, Good thing this is going to be recorded audio plus video because then you can see me blush here because I always just tell people I've got a great face for radio. And believe it or not, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. I am actually an introvert. So So that's funny because we also talked about that before the show and I referred to you as an extrovert and I guess you probably grimaced and I missed it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny thing and I don't know enough about the science behind it, right? But introverts my understanding, especially from teaching, is the things you can focus on and care about, right? You can summon the energy and then right. you're potentially wiped out afterward, right? You've hit it right on the right on the on the bullseye. I will luckily I if I can and I do it well, I don't schedule anything right after this episode because right. then I will go take a power nap. And even with my coaching work, I, I have days where I'm coaching back to back. And right. by the end of the day, I'm just exhausted because I've invested everything. It's, it's now, rough. I really appreciate it. So one of the great glitches of my DNA is I am an extrovert, but also I almost never feel wiped out. Uh, and then when I am wiped out, of course, then I'm completely done. So one of the things I've had to learn, especially as a teacher, college teacher, is that clearly not everybody's like that. So I have to build in all the stuff for introverts. And it's been very helpful to learn about because... Up to a certain point in my life, I wasn't sensitive enough to it, which makes you both a poor teacher and a poor coach and not a great human either. So I'm very conscious of that now. Okay. Now, you mentioned the word teacher, and I don't recall the last time you and I were in the same spot. It was at a, I forget the organization, but you were keynoting. I was there. In fact, that's how you and I met. Yeah. Is Was teaching something you have done in the past, back in the 2000s, 90s? Is this this a new role for you? Good question. Yeah. So no, not new exactly. I guess it depends how people define their career paths. I have been teaching for Lake Forest College uh, for about, (laughs) it's going on 10 years. So when I met you, I was probably two or three years into that. Since then- though it has since been undermined. I've also been teaching at Columbia College. So it's an interesting mix of a liberal arts college, which is a blast, and then an arts college, both of which, though, have sort of tapped me to be involved in sort of focus on career stuff, not as a writer, not as a nonprofit person or a strategist. One of my sort of side hustles and passions is talking about work. And in both cases, they were classes focused on how you build careers. I... Remember now, it was Columbia. That's where I, I saw you uh, uh, join the faculty. But I love the role of helping people with their careers because when I was going through coach training, nobody said, Howard, here's how you grow your coaching business. Here's how you become an entrepreneur. Here's how you market yourself to a big company. You can become an internal coach. There's not many of those opportunities out there. And I love that you are helping folks who, they have this passion for the arts, but they right. have, perhaps don't have the wherewithal, quote unquote, the clue. See, I did the air quote first, by the way. Well done. To, Good. You beat me to it. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, how do you help them craft their career or begin to think about how do you promote and brand yourself to get noticed? 
Yeah, it's really interesting. I really love all the ways you phrase that. And what's interesting with Columbia College, I had been pursuing a gig there for ages. And finally, they called me and they're like, could you start next week? It was oh. no turnarounds. I don't know what was going on at the time. And it was a class literally called uh, self-management and freelancing. So how do you build an art career and make money? And uh, which is something I've done both successfully and arguably very unsuccessfully, which we can talk about. I, and I'm, there's a reason I'm stressing this part. I said, do you need me to design a class in the next two weeks? Because my other class at Lake Forest College is also career focused, but not for artists, for all types of people. And there was an original class that they slowly let me redesign and overhaul the more I've learned. So with Columbia, I thought I could build something from scratch, but oh my gosh. And then they said, no, 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 we have a blueprint for the class. Don't F it up. Like, we actually <laughs> just want you to come in and execute, which is actually something I'm good at right. because it's easy for me. Well, I say this, so now I'm going to contradict myself. I don't have a lot of ego about that kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. if you just need me to be the person not to mess things up, that's actually a good I don't need to bring my personality into it. Though they were also mm. like, don't not bring your personality. So the reason I'm mm. sharing all that is they designed this, I think, and I really mean this, amazing class around all the things to think about, not about why you're a great artist or model or dancer or cinematographer, but how can you think about that as a, in a constructive, structured way? And so, right, how do you think about branding? How do you think about how do you think about writing grants? How do you think about strategic planning? And so those are things that I've actually spent a lot of time on in the various parts of my life. I hadn't necessarily thought about it as, wow, they're all, I know they're all connected, but I haven't thought about teaching a class around it. They really handed me something I'm incredibly passionate about anyway, and it was a lot of fun. I do not have a slot this current spring, but I hope to get back because I taught there for the last three years and it was a blast. And the students were wonderful. I mean, they were very exciting to me. Fantastic. I, I love that. And Columbia is just a cool place. I mean, it's the you get to go there and pursue your craft, whatever that craft might it be. It is a really cool place. With, it, it's funny, and I'm not above this. It made me feel cooler just being, I've become an amazingly like norm core, boring adult person, human, which I really like. So it's kind of fun to be around a bunch of people who are the, literally the opposite, but have similar goals, you know? Okay. Well, you've got, you've got the nice professory kind of beard. You got nice glasses. You still have the hair. I, I have the other jeans <laughs> where the hair loss comes in. Did you wear a the nice coat with the patches or anything like that? Or It's funny. <laughs> I didn't for that class, but years ago, my wife and I were out and I saw what I thought was this stunning brown corduroy coat, which is so professory. And I said, I'm just going to buy this for the times I want to look more academic. It's probably very out of style now. But of course, anything professor is out of style. So I do have the one coat. I bust it out on occasion for those kind of things. Okay. Now, I just, I know we have to talk about the book. I mean, that's, that's why you and I are here today. But I do have to add in one little item. I was listening to NPR, National Public Radio, and I guess that kind of defines a little bit of my... Uh, my belief system and, but they had uh, Mark Ruffalo on, on, on a, on a particular uh, piece there. He was talking about a new movie that he has coming out. And I was just thinking, as I'm talking to you, you could probably play yourself, but I think Mark Ruffalo could play you if there was a movie about Ben Tanzer. I would be thrilled. I love Mark Ruffalo. He's now an upstate New Yorker by where geography. I'm from upstate New York originally. Uh, he's very popular. My wife would be very happy to hear that. She's a fan. So yeah, if he's willing, um, it's only going to enhance the whole project of being me. So yeah, I'm in. I appreciate okay. that. Excellent. The Missing, uh, a novel. And I love when I took a stab at this, uh, at a, I, I lifted from a review. I think I probably stole, I think stole it is the, is stolen is the right, correct choice of words of, of and said, a deeply psychological portrait of marriage that is both full of pathos and frighteningly real. That scares me, Ben. I guess good. Someone the other day said it's kind of a horror novel. I thought, really? Uh, which then made me very happy because those really sell. Yeah, it's funny. I think the real part is the part I probably is most not fictional, right? I understand that part of it. And then the pathos part is not really part of my life, but it's what I wanted to sort of, you know, explicate, I don't know what the right word is, like dig into. 
And so I love that. I mean, if people feel I hit those marks, that was conscious, but it is interesting to see it. I don't have a lot of pathos personally, but I'm fascinated to write about it. Always have been. And so I'm glad it comes out, of course. Okay. How did this book come about? Was there a spark? Was this idea in, in line at Starbucks or, you know, walking the, walking the dog in the neighborhood? Where did this idea come from? You know, it's funny. In a way, it's all of the above, but there is actually a very interesting origin story to the piece, to the piece of this, which is I had a novel that was like, I took a stab at a YA novel several years ago. I wanted to write like a YA sort of crime novel to see if I could do that. And what I was primarily interested in was, could you write something about a younger person that younger people and older people would enjoy? And it just didn't get any yeah. traction. I, I spoke to one agent about it. He got really excited. Then he abandoned it. And then I abandoned it. And I thought, okay, this maybe isn't what I think it is. Later, I now have, I now have an agent. He wasn't my agent. I met her and she was like, you need to come up with a novel for us. I, we want a novel. We want mm -hmm. some sort of Nick Cornby middle-aged guy thing. You're middle-aged. Make that happen. And, and she said, and then she paused and said, what's your pitch, right? And not that anyone needs a pro tip from me, but you always have to have a pitch in your back pocket. I, I don't care what your business is. Know what you want to try to sell. And so I paused and then I thought, well, I had been plotting out in my head. This gets to your question. An idea of writing about a marriage over a long period of time with different ups and downs and different sort of milestones. One of those things was going to be that the parents have to deal with their child running away. Mm. And so in the moment, I said, well, I've got this marriage book and uh, there's a series of things that'll happen, blah, blah, blah. And the child will run away. And my agent looked at me and said, no, that's it. I want that to be the whole book. Write a book about two parents dealing with their kid running away. And I thought, and she goes, no, that's it. Do that. And so in my head, I started to merge it with this book that I had shelved that had all this background material. And so then, of course, and this I think you can appreciate, then my brain really started cranking. I thought, oh, that book I shelved, some of that can be backstory about the kid and some of that can be backstory about the mom. And then I'll need a dad figure. And then I started cranking in my head. Well, what would that look like? And then somewhere I made a decision, this kid's running away and is not coming back. That's the book. And so mm. the book isn't even about the kid. It's about the parents. And that's why the pathos comes in. So how mm. are they going to manage both having their kid run away? A kid who's not so young that anybody cares, but is not so old, like anyone meaning the authorities, the police, uh, and not because they don't care. Like It's a teenage kid who's like, I'm leaving. Bye. Uh, but what do the parents do with that? This gap in their life, this ghost, now ghost. And then what do they do when they have to think about all the things that they don't normally have to think about because they've been able to focus on their child and going to work? What's the marriage look like after that? What do they look like? So that all happened in like 30 seconds in my head. I made the pitch. My uh, agent said, go write that. I went and wrote it. And then, of course, all the other stuff filled in. So there is a legitimate like instigating thing. She said, that's your hook. I thought, wow, I didn't think about that. One big idea. Let's run with mm. that for 200 pages. So that happened. That's happened. Okay. And maybe one thing that doesn't come out in the reviews or hasn't yet is that I very then very consciously thought each chapter will switch POV or point of view between the wife and the husband. So they'll constantly be playing off each other, even if they're not talking to each other, even if they're not in the same room, we will be tracking them in real time, more or less. Mm. I can imagine, and you correct me, is this kind of, in some ways, like reverse system theory, like here's the event, child gone, runs away, and then you can kind of, kind of reverse create all the little things that happened prior, and then, and then something before that and before that, to get to this point, it's kind of like, Again, that's what I was thinking. What I was thinking about when I was reading the uh, the pitch piece it is just about their lives, and because I would imagine there'd be a lot of blame between each one, the, the husband and the wife. That's really well said, right? So I did. I completely reverse engineered it, even as I was, and I don't know what it's called when you forward engineer it. So one of the things then that became conscious in the process was, how do I tell the story moving forward? but balance it with the hints and clues and not just the reverse engineering of what happened or didn't happen with the daughter who's to blame, 
but what happened in their respective lives as they were growing up and becoming adults so that you see the different influences. So one thing I've mentioned, I'm happy to mention, which doesn't give anything away because it's obvious very early on, is that the mother, the female protagonist, is dealing with a daughter who ran away, but also it has a lifetime of dealing with a mother who ran away. Mm. So early on, you realize that she's caught in this weird juxtaposition. Am I someone who people run away from? And, and on the one hand, how could that be? She was a child when her mother left. It has nothing to do with her. On the other hand, you don't know, right? So then the pathos you get to mine is what's wrong with me? What did I do to my daughter? But then, of course, the husband and the male protagonist, he's not sure what he did. And one of the things they play with, which is very much reflective of how my brain is, mm -hmm. is trying to deconstruct what might have been wrong and like what incidents carry weight and what incidents don't carry weight. How do we disappoint the people in our lives? And it is, is it as profound as we think it is? Or is it to them just another thing? So you're trying to pick that stuff apart. So yeah, I was very interested in sort of layering all those layers backwards and forwards. And like, is this why? Is this why? And why didn't we talk more? Or why didn't we talk better? Why wasn't I better at this? And then of course, as a parent, and uh, I'm sure I'm, a, oh, <laughs> I say this most self-deprecating and also with tons of guilt. I'm sure I'm fine, but not great. That becomes part of the dynamic. You're like, I was present, wasn't I? I did ask questions, didn't I? And yet here we are. So I did something wrong. Interesting. As a coach, and my training is what's called evidence-based. So we bring in uh, processes, ideas, uh, techniques from a lot of other disciplines, so psychology, sociology, adult development. And one thing I've always have learned, I, one thing I learned, and I, I, I firmly believe it, because uh, I'm still single, okay? Uh, in my young age, is right. a lot of what happens in our lives could have been just this innocuous moment way back many, many, many years ago. And we don't realize that that, that event, that incident, as benign as it, or uh, inconsequential as it might have been, affects us today. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's funny because you and I could do this theme alone across everything we both do, including podcasts and coaching. And I also do coaching. But what I think is really important about your point, and there are a dozen things that are important, but in terms of the book and in terms of who I am as a writer, running away is a big thing. But I'm much more interested in all the small stuff that may or may not be innocuous or quotidian, right? So I took a big swing with this conceptually, but the rest of the book is really focused on all those little things. Um, as a human, as a person, I don't know why I've used the word human three times. I'm not going to do that again. But as a person, <laughs> I'm fascinated by the small things because I always say to people, I'm not sure any of them are as small as you're treating them, right? So when I'm a coach, I say to people, let's look at all the stuff that made you who you are today. And when I'm talking mm -hmm. to my students about writing their resume or doing their LinkedIn bio, I say, it's all important. It doesn't mean it's all equally important, but you also don't know entirely why you are who you are, nor do you know how you're going to be perceived or what's going to connect with people. So you may think that job you had at McDonald's or mowing lawns is not as important as your amazing internship, but the person interviewing you might be someone who mowed lawns. So mm -hmm. how can we tell the whole story? And so that's something I try to do as both an author and a coach, as a teacher, which is what's the whole story? There's a lot of value in small stuff. We always joke around, don't sweat the small stuff, right? That's about not being caught up in an endless cycle of anxiety and depression, sometimes, which sometimes we can't avoid. But as a way of telling your story, I'm like, do sweat the small stuff. The small stuff's fascinating. And it's, it's worth taking a moment to think about it. Listen, how do you feel? And that's yep. another reason why we have coaches to help you or therapists or counselors. Because, think about it because it is important. There, is, there are connections to make. So I'm curious, how many characters are in the book? You, you've got the daughter who has run away, so she is there. Uh, but besides the husband and the wife, how many other characters are there? So it's funny. I didn't do this purposely. And like, I have a theater kid in the house, and I've always been a theater person. I love going to see shows, something my mom and I did, but I do with my wife. So in a way, it's a two-hander, as they say in the theater world. There are two primary characters playing off each other and the world. 
And then there's a number of minor characters, which I hope, which I believe, let me say it that way, are still fairly rich. But um, there's maybe three or four other people you regularly see. There's the police officer who's involved in the case. Okay. Um, the mother and her her single father have a lot of interaction, as does the single father, father slash father-in-law and his son-in-law. And then the son-in-law interacts a lot with his mother, um, as does the the female protagonist a bit. So you've got sort of two parents involved. You've got this cop involved. Um, and they're most of the characters. I mean, it really is a two-hander. And it was very intentionally internal, right? Like, what are they going through? And I'm always fascinated by that too, right? What the internal battles are, what the internal dialogue is. And then, of course, if you're in a relationship, how does that play out between two people? We don't communicate everything. We lie, even in healthy relationships, right? We say the wrong things. We lie to our partners. We withhold information, um, and sometimes for their benefit. But I'm, that's what I'm really focused on. So there's a lot of that going. Okay. As you were bringing back some of the ideas you had in this earlier earlier writing, now you're writing this book. What type of help do you get when it comes, besides your agent putting, yes, write it, do this. What type of help does writing a book like this require so that when you get to the finish line, you know, you know, this, this book just hits on all cylinders. Yeah, really good process question. So most of us or many of us author types, we will have sort of beta readers along the way. Usually it's friends, other authors. The ones we trust will be honest. So that I build into most of my book projects. Um, however, in this case, I will say this doesn't always feel like this. I was like laser focused on what I wanted to do. And so in this case, what really got it across the finish line, because I don't know that I did the beta reader with this. I got really excited about it. And when I reconnected with my agent, we did two more rounds. So the agent thing is interesting. Um, and I'm not an expert on agents. My particular agent was like, you come up with the book I love, we'll sign you. Like, we're not going to sign you because we're fans. You've got to come up with something we like. That gives you a little wiggle room. You don't want to disappoint your agent more than anyone else, but you want it to be as perfect as possible, but they're reading it in partnership with you. So, which is a beautiful thing. I went 20 plus years without an agent. And it was always asking friends and family and other people to read things. So when I brought it to her, we did two more rounds of edits. The first was sort of like some broad ideas, how to tighten or rethink them or deepen them. And then the second round was like smaller stuff, like this sentence on page 70. Now that doesn't sound right. So we did that. That got it really tight. Uh, and then when it ended up with the current publisher, he had a different set of edits, which were fascinating because. It was something I did purposely and it didn't totally fly with him. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, you don't have to take my advice. We're running with this book, but I think it'll be better. And I'm someone who really trusts experts. I, I have an enormous ego, I'm sure. But if you've got a planned set of thoughts and you want to defend them, I'm all ears on anything I do. So he was like, here's my thinking. Feel mm -hmm. free to ignore it. I thought, oh, no, no, that's great. It was the way I was using the past tense parts of the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I rewrote those. I rewrote them, not the scenes themselves. I mean, not the content, but how I played with the tenses. And so that got that to the finish line. But that was very much, and I benefited, and I am blessed. I have a really good agent. And then this publisher had some ideas, and they both made the book substantively better. Like, if it was good anyway. So that was this book. Other books, you'll I'll bounce off someone early on, and I've done that a number of times. Okay. I'd like to shift back to Columbia for a second because, sure. and I will come back to the book because you've been around the block, gotten books and the, the storytelling and all the other project, creative projects that you have been involved with. You have these students at Columbia who are aspiring to, whether it's music, art, photography, acting, what would be your advice to them for getting that agent? Because every a lot of what we see these days, I'm on my own. I, I'm going to make it on my own. I'm going to self-publish my book. But you're going the traditional route, which at the end, we really do care about that. You've got a, an agent and you've got a publisher. That's hard in this day and age. How do you coach 
your students and how to go about being successful or hopefully more successful than if they didn't do it. Yeah. So it's interesting. First off, I'm going to do the caveat I always do because I've got my mother in my head, uh, which is a whole other thing. We could talk about growing up with a therapist as a mom. Uh, um, uh, mother. No, I got, don't... I got, I have mother stuff and she's terrific oh, yeah. by the way. And she'll probably listen. So this is a shout out to my mom. But one time very early in my career, she was like, I was talking about all the things you're referring to. So I'm going to get to those in 20 seconds. But she said, and you have to be a really good writer first. Like she wouldn't, it was really awesome because that's so her personality. Like, I think all that stuff's important, but hone your craft. So it maybe goes without saying, but it's still good to mention. You have to be honing your craft as off, mm -hmm. right? You have to be doing that. Like someone like you is a great example. I have known you now for X amount of years. I have watched you and talked to you. You have been honing your podcast craft, how you speak, the materials you use. The platforms, you're an experiment. My impression is you're always trying to innovate and experiment and following you on LinkedIn. I know how seriously you take the marketing, right? So those things go hand in hand. And so I always start with make sure you're the best version of yourself as that creator. Then there are a series of things and some of them people push back on and I just smile. I know they work or they have the potential to work. I mean, there's a better work word for this, but you have to be constantly connecting with people, right? So the reason I have the agent I have is that 20 odd years ago, I had connected with an editor of a local Chicago magazine. She sent me out on assignment to interview one of the original Chicago podcast groups. The agent was the wife of one of the people in that podcast group. He said, you should meet my wife. She's also a writer. She wasn't an agent yet. We had coffee and for years we would meet for breakfast two, three times a year and just talk about writing. So my agent is also a nearly 25 year relationship. So making connections and I'm a big fan and people sometimes give me a look, nurturing those relationships, checking mm -hmm. in over time, saying hello. This is the cheesier stuff. but So that's one piece. I know it's not actually cheesy, but I always get a lot of looks. I'm getting a smile from you. So you're always nurturing relationships. That's a very big part of it. Um, you are simultaneously doing your homework, I would suggest, all the time in the most organic slash strategic way possible. Who are the people you want to work with? How do you meet them? Where will they be? Which then adds another layer, which is wherever people will be, even in the age of Zoom and the internet, and we're still in the pandemic, but we're somewhat post-pandemic, you have to be the places people are. So, you know, we started making a comment about you being an introvert, right? So I say to introverts, figure out how much energy you have how many events you can go to, how many people you can talk to, and then be super targeted. So I have from the start left the house nonstop wherever it meant that I was going to potentially meet people I needed to meet. So that's a really big part of it. Then you have to balance it with a million things, but pitching, looking for the proper outlets for your work, pitching to places where writers you admire, who have agents you want, know where that work is. And then also, to the extent anyone can handle it, I try, I'm try. i not judgy or pushy about this, whatever forms of now social media or any forms of marketing you can bear, and I think that's an important word here because I don't want people to do stuff they're uncomfortable with, you really want to be out there. I don't think it's required to have 10,000 followers on Instagram, um, though that doesn't hurt, for someone to be interested in you. But if you're using Instagram, are you using it in an interesting way? Have you formed a brand? Are you telling a narrative? So you mentioned storytelling. One of the things I really value, though I may or may not be a great storyteller or as great as I want to be, is trying to get people to constantly be thinking, what's my story? Right? Where are my passions? How do they hang together? So then you start seeing like a formula, right? There's making connections. Well, there's doing the work. There's making connections. There's getting out of the house, the hustle part. And then there's the constantly generating content, but in a professional manner. And, and we can joke because you joked about TikTok, uh, using as many platforms as you can stand also, because one of my long running theories, and I don't have any data to back this up, is that you don't know where people are going to find you, if they even find you. So be in as many places as you can. Um, that has not always led, and now I'll stop talking, has not always led to author opportunities, but it has led for me anyway to coaching opportunities, freelance opportunities, keynote. The keynote where you met me, um, this was a weird, gratifying thing. And actually, it speaks to one of the questions you have in your 
free form, though I didn't think of it at the time. When I got hired for that keynote, which I want to say was very meaningful for me because I had a full-time job for years and years and years, and I keynoted all around the country. I had a, it was a big job for me. I don't know if it was a big job, but I was doing things I really enjoyed. And I got fired from that job, which we could also talk about. And then I was on my own. And I were to reinvent myself and hey, build ben, a website and think about it. Ben, and I got ben. hired for that keynote gig. Oh, yeah. We, we froze for about five seconds. Oh, no kidding. Okay. So um, let's, let's pick up the story again from the, 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 where you and I met at the keynote. Great. Okay. So, so three, okay, I'll give you a chance to kind of get your thoughts. Okay. One, two, three. So when we met at that keynote, I think one of the reasons that's a good story and a reaffirming story is that I had rebuilt what I hoped my post full-time life would be. And when I met the folks who were hiring me, I said, so, hey, who recommended me? And they said, oh, no, no one recommended you. We Googled a bunch of keywords and your website popped up and we were shocked. You're an author. You worked in nonprofits. You do coaching. You believe in leadership and storytelling. I'm like, yes, that's all in there. And they said, right, we know. That's why you're having coffee with us. So I put that out there because whenever someone says to me, do you need to be thoughtful about how to organize your story and your thoughts? I'm like, well, I've always believed it. And in that case, it led to a really wonderful opportunity for me. So uh, I don't know if that answers the original question, but it is a very interesting part of this, which is building the world you want to be in. Sure, sure. And the fact that you and I met at this keynote and here we are today, so... Absolutely. Voila. And you know, yeah. I will say, and then I'll let you ask your question. I'm sorry. I met you. Uh, and again, I'll embarrass you again, but I was completely taken right with just your whole vibe, how you talked about the work. And in my head, though, I don't do this consciously. I thought I will not let go of Howard Fox if he wants to stay friends, right? If people don't want to work with me or be friends, I try not to sweat it. But if you're remotely interested, I will stay in touch. I mean, I won't hopefully you can tell me not be pushy, but I'll support you. I'll be interested in what you're doing. I'll check in. I'll try to invite you to things I'm doing because I want those relationships time memorial. So, you know, you're, this is one of those cases where that's worked out and I'm honored by it because I love what you do. I appreciate that. Thank you. And you're also highlighting and we're, it's something you and I are, are definitely both aligned with. You have to be intentional about wanting to get out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can't just have your head down. I just want to do my work. That just does not cut it. A term I use with my coaching clients is you have to continually seed opportunities. And once you plant that seed, you have to nurture them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You just and, said that much more eloquently than I just said. And I agree with, with all of that. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. And, um, Intentions are a really important word. I don't think I used it enough earlier in my life. I've always been very intentional, not always successfully, right? Let's not confuse effort and success, but it is important. And that was another thing, especially with the Columbia class. So also in my class at Lake Forest, let's be intentional about what we want to do, where we want to go, who we want to meet. And, and this is a big and, if you don't know where you want to go, who you want to meet, what you want to do, then be intentional about figuring that out, right? Doing mm -hmm. as much as possible and looking for surprises. So another word I'm a big fan of, and I think this is built in because of my parents, so I have an advantage. That's not even a humble brag. I am eminently, if that's the right word, curious about everything. Like, I really do want to understand how everything works. And when you're someone like that, and I do think you can train yourself to become that way, it's a practice. Then, of course, the options become unlimited because I'm happy to talk to anyone about anything, even if it's a topic per se, I'm not interested in. I still want to know how it works. How does cryptocurrency work? I am not going to be investing in cryptocurrency, but yeah. I do want to find someone to explain it to me. I'll spend an hour at a bar with someone. They can do their whole pitch because I want to understand how their brain is. I don't know why it works. I don't want, I'm not even interested. I think it's a scam. That's cool. I still want to get it. So I appreciate that little uh, tangent to Columbia and, and this idea of teaching and uh, branding and seeding networking. So as we come back to the book for a second, I am curious, as the book is about ready to be fully published and available, 
uh, to the public. Who's your main audience for it? I'm glad you asked that because I've been trying to disentangle that. That's something, of course, again, with a Columbia class, I asked them to think about. Your audience can't be everyone. Everybody right. says they want it to be everyone. Uh, I believe the audience are people, young or old, this part I will say, who are especially interested in sort of literary fiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not that I write at the level I'd like to write at. I don't think I'm going to be Alice Munro, though I would love to be Alice Munro. But I am trying to tell a very literary story, right? something that engages people. I think people also have to be interested in domestic relations. I don't know what the genre is I'm operating in, mm -hmm. but it's definitely how do we all communicate? How do we all cope? You know, and how do all those small things, go back to your early point, add up? If that's of interest to you, then I'm your guy. This book happens to be a little bit of a horror book, which wasn't intended, right? But I love that. Uh, it is, though, about how we all try to connect and disconnect and do things poorly. So people want have to want to read books like that. If they're looking for something more, and by the way, I love all genres. I should stress that. If they're looking for something more romantic or more thriller, uh, I will or sci-fi, I will probably disappoint them. But if they're interested in how do we talk and how do we mess all that up, if that's a genre, that's my genre for sure. Would that encapsulate my probably my last question, which was going to be, what insights or awareness do you hope your readers take away from the book? You know, I'm really interested in like raw nerves. The closer the nerves are to the surface of your skin, A, the more I want to hang out with you and I want to try to write about it. What I hope people take away is that sort of sense of, oh, that small stuff is important. And if I'm caught up in something small, it should not be dismissed, right? Like it's important to me and I need to understand it. So I hope people read it and think, I see myself there. Whether you're single or married, this isn't really about, it doesn't have to be about being in a long-term marriage. It has to be about how do I connect with people and how do I get in my own way sometimes, right? Because that's part of it too, right? We get in our own way. We're stuck. We have our, we have our poor coping skills. We have our childhoods. Like we're always working through, I really believe we're working through that all day long, every day, all of us. And so that's what I want people to take away that it's worth trying to be self-aware, but also, and I really mean this, give yourself more grace and forgiveness, right? We all will make mistakes. We need to find people who understand us and can live with our mistakes. And then we have an obligation to be better, right? Part of the thread of this book is, can you be better for the person you're most involved with? And this couple, it's not clear they can be. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things we follow. Can they do better by themselves and for one another? That's not clear. So that's part of the, the exploration that's going on. I love it. I love it. Your next steps, obviously, the book is, by the time this episode gets published, I think the book will probably just have come out. Uh, is there an expectation of more podcasts, speaking engagements, the local, is Barnes & Noble still around? I don't even know. They're opening a new one. And so, of course, it's immediately controversial because the city they're moving into Wicker Park where that long running CVS was in that bank. Oh yeah. So anyway, they're taking over that building, which is cool. You know, Barnes and Noble 20 years ago or 15 years ago was frowned upon. Now they're actually seen as bolstering neighborhoods and getting actual print copies out. So there's an interesting shift, uh, but people aren't happy about them using that location because there's a bunch of independent bookstores over there. That yeah. said, uh, my hope and reality is both is I'll be actually doing a series of book readings of which are already scheduled. So I was on top of that, uh, kicking off at the wonderful Exile in Bookville down in the South Loop. So mm -hmm. forward your old neck of the woods. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm also going to New York City and Philadelphia and Los Angeles. So I am leveraging, milking, begging, reaching out to people I know from other parts of my life or other authors I've worked with or things I did in the past. And so I've set up a series of book readings and I'm, yeah, trying to hustle and pitch different podcasters. I'm honored because you reached out to me, which is the best feeling. And then I'm also balancing that with reaching out to some people I just don't know and saying, hey, we've never met, but I'm an admirer of yours. Um, I'm doing an interview tomorrow with a podcast and it's a more arts related, but I just love the person's vibe. I'm very vibe driven. So yes, but of course my hope is other things will emerge. I was reaching out to an old friend who's now a 
tenured professor in a whole other part of the universe. And I was just saying hello. And then he said, I think we can probably get you on campus next year for an event. So that's not why I reached out to him. I reached out to him because I miss him. Uh, and I hadn't heard from him recently. And I was supposed mm -hmm. to see him and didn't. Uh, but I'm hoping some of those things will happen just by being out in the world. That's the part you can't predict, just like you can't predict whether anyone's actually going to buy your book. So I took care of the things I could take care of. And now I'm trying to be responsive to all the things that I wasn't prepared for. Mm -hmm. And I'll just leave it to the universe and it'll, it'll take care of itself. Which is very uncomfortable, by the way. That's probably the thing I'm least good at. <laughs> I, I hear you there. I hear you there. Then before we do head out, you again, and I alluded to this, you have so many other talents. Where would you like or invite, I should say, our listeners, if they'd like to learn more about you? And folks, if you really want to, I'm going to make him blush. I don't know if I can really do that. You really need to get to know Ben. And just a phenomenal individual and just very talented. So, Ben, after forcing that upon you, where are the best places the, that you would like to send our listen, listeners to if they'd like to learn more about you and your work above and beyond the, this wonderful book? I really appreciate that. Certainly, tanzerben.com, my website. As I preach to anybody who listens and I work with, it's good to have a mothership and it's good to have everything on the mothership. And, uh, if you wanted to learn about me, that's a great place to go. I have also really done my best to uh, leverage LinkedIn. That is work-oriented. But of course, mm -hmm. for me, not over the years, my work life and personal passions and hustles have merged, and I've allowed them to merge. So if you go to either of those places, you'll get an introduction. And without being too pushy, if you want to reach out and connect on the phone, have a cup of coffee if you drink gin, which I do, uh, though not like I used to. I'm always happy to sit down with anyone and just figure out what's going on, but certainly start with the website or LinkedIn. It's a great introduction and any follow-up I'm completely interested in doing with you. I love that. And you know, something you just about the, the gin is <laughs> I, I just did a, a four episode series with Papa's Pilar rum. So Papa's Pilar, Pilar was Ernest Hemingway's boat. Oh, all right. And so this company has a connection with the Hemingway family which I thought was, that was pretty cool. And this was a, very as cool. a result of a relationship. Somebody I saw, hey, I'd love to do this series. So good quality rum. It's like pretty awesome. My point though is this episode is going to get heard around the world, perhaps some places more than others. But if you ever make it to Chicago, you need to reach out to Ben and Go go find that wonderful bar and have a have a gin with him. And so well, uh, I will say I have a lot of bars I like to go to here. So we'll also find one in your neighborhood, whoever you are. And as a shout out to Howard's comment, if you're a rum person, down the street for me is a terrific. I'm going to give them a a plug, but there's a terrific craft cocktail bar called Sparrow, okay. and they really love their rum drinks. So I am not necessarily a rum drinker, though certainly I'd be happy to connect with your rum people. But I always get rum drinks there, and they're delightful. So, yes, come to Chicago. We'll go to Sparrow for a rum drink, and we'll toast Howard as well. Fantastic. I need to get back to Chicago and have you that do. drink with you. You do. You do. You and I have to go get a drink. Exactly. Now, we will definitely provide uh, the backlinks to the website, LinkedIn. By the way, thank you for acknowledging the work that I do on LinkedIn. It's always uh, appreciated. And uh, oh, God, You're exemplary. I, You know, I'm not embarrassed to embarrass you. If people are trying to figure out how to do it well, you're one of the models for it. Uh, you're just super thoughtful and strategic about it and interesting, which we shouldn't leave that out, right? <laughs> it helps to bring your personality to things. I think sometimes people get scared. Like, I can be very fanboy and a little too enthusiastic about everything, I suppose. Uh, my wife and children hate it. But I used to worry about that on social media. And then I just dropped it. I thought, why am I curbing that part of my personality? You do that very well, too. Because one thing that always strikes me again, I'm just going to embarrass you. You know, the <laughs> things you're interested in, you're so intensely interested in them that they actually become more appealing. I want to know more about it because the way you write about it. So, yes, I'm happy to give you a shout because I think you've done it very well and people can learn from it. Thank you. I appreciate that coming from you. I really do. Ben, it's been great to catch up, and I, we wish you much success, continued success. Uh, I'm excited about uh, the missing. I'm excited to 
check into the pathos and the frighteningly real pieces of the book and really want to see, you know, where it lands and what that, what that last paragraph and the last chapter I have to say. And so I'm very excited, look forward to it. And again, I wish you much success. Thank you for joining us on the author series on the Success Insight Podcast. It was great to see you again. It's wonderful to see you. And I really appreciate this opportunity, Howard. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Listen, stay in the line. We're going to do a real quick close. And then you and I can have a final chat. All right, folks. We have just been chatting with the fantastic Ben Tanzer, author of The Missing, a novel. And really just, I think what, what I love best about getting together with Ben is we kind of riff on a lot of different things. You know, I think eventually we do tie the pieces together. Uh, but look, this is a wonderful opportunity to get to know a wonderful author, storyteller, coach. He's also a podcaster, has his own wonderful uh, podcast. His literary podcast is the po this podcast will change your life. We'll provide backlinks to it as well as to his website, his LinkedIn profile. And we're also going to provide a backlink to his favorite craft uh uh, cocktail bar, Sparrow. I don't even know if they were there when I was back in Chicago, but uh, I digress. I'll visit it when I get back there the next right time. On. There you go. Now, folks, uh, again, uh, do check it out. Do check out on your wherever you get your uh, your books from, whether it's uh, the online sources or your local uh, bookstore. Hopefully, a uh, um, uh, I, don't, I forget what the name of that is. The, the independent bookstores. There's a lot of them out there. But if it, you don't see the missing uh, on the shelf, definitely ask the uh, the owner, the manager to order a copy for you. As for us on Success Insight Podcast, you can find us on our LinkedIn and Facebook pages. All of our episodes are now up on YouTube. Uh, there are also uh, short videos, video shorts up on YouTube. So you can vid visit us there. That, we put all those episodes up there uh, this week. You can find us on our website, successinsightpodcast.com. And of course, you can listen to us on all of the leading podcast directories. Just do a search for Success Insight Podcast. Sites like Spotify, you can even just click on the author series and you're going to get this episode as well as our other episodes with uh, many other talented authors. Okay, folks, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. We look forward to hearing from you. We love those likes, comments shares and until next time on the success inside podcast go out there have a phenomenal day and take care of yourselves and your family and we will see you again soon take care now.